I think without further ado, as people are coming in, I am um, morning Erasmus. I'm going to get started since that's our last day. We still have a fair amount to cover. Uh, we're so happy that everybody's here. And um, the beginning of this are slides that you've already seen. So we will run through these pretty quickly. Great, super, all right. So um, this is a slide you've seen every time we've gotten together. These are the learning objectives that we were um, aspiring to for this course. Uh, you know them, we all know them. Today in particular, we're paying very close attention to objective four, which is assessing and measuring progress towards reducing gender-related obstacles to immunization. Um, next slide and back to you, Liz. Great, thanks, Willow. Um, again, just a quick reminder that all the resources, um, so the slides, uh, the recordings from the previous sessions um, and today's session will be stored on the Boost community platform. Um, I think most of you have already created an account and have access to the group and have participated in some conversations on uh, the platform, uh, but we do encourage you to visit boostcommunity.org uh, to set up your account today. Um, and just in terms of today's session, just a few quick logistic uh, reminders. So we ask that you do please mute yourself when not speaking to limit any background noise and feedback. Um, you can always use the reactions button uh, to raise your hand once we get to the Q&A section. Um, and then of course, we uh, highly encourage you to engage in dialogue with your peers um, and today's uh, workshop facilitators through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can test the chat now by sharing your name um, and one thing that you've thought more of since the bank beginning of this course. And then on this slide, I just have a few kind of frequently asked questions, um, especially as it pertains to the end of the course and certification. Um, so I've already gone over where the resources will be stored, which is in that Boost Learning Group. Um, in terms of missed sessions and homework assignments, uh, you can view the course tracker that we have available. Um, once you find your name, you'll see um, your uh, attendance marked for each session and then whether or not you've completed each uh, post-session homework assignment. Um, we are only allowing one week to do any makeup work and complete those homework assignments. So we just do encourage you to check out that course tracker um, in order to make up any work um, so that you can receive a certifi uh, certificate of completion. Um, and then in terms of when you'll be receiving that certificate, we do uh, ask that you allow our team at least two weeks. Uh, we need to update the course tracker and prepare your certificates. Once they are ready, they'll be uploaded to your Boost member profile, um, and you'll be able to download the PDF from there. Um, and we will email everyone uh, once they are uploaded to your profile. I think that's it for me, so I'm going to pass it back over to Willow. Thanks, Liz. So these are the expectations and you've, uh, you know them. I'm not gonna go through, through them again. I just do want to say thank you to all those who, of you who, have, who really have been so active and it's been a, an, a complete pleasure um, to be able to see uh, you being so active and, and posing questions and engaging. And it has made for a very fruitful exchange and it's, uh, it's been an excellent experience. Next slide. So again, today on July 14th, we're gonna be talking about assessing progress and learning together. Next slide for the full agenda of today. So this is where we're at. Um, we will try to keep to time. And um, we have two speakers today. We have Rebecca Fields once again, and then we have Gaspar Kome from Village Reach. We also have a video uh, presentation by Dr. Uh, Ahmed from UNICEF Pakistan. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us live, but we do have a presentation for him from him on um, gender and social determinants of health in urban poor communities of Pakistan, which is very interesting. Next slide. So very quickly, homework, the last homework that you had. Um, you were asked to select one of the videos from Bull City Learning, and the, the top three are as follows, encouraging fathers' participation in immunization, coaching health workers to create a welcoming environment, and reaching all audiences with immunization messages. Next slide. 
And then you were asked to prior prioritize one gender barrier. And um, overwhelmingly, people were interested in poor quality service and negative health provider attitudes. So with that, next slide, please. We asked what possible solutions you might have relative to, to your chosen gender barrier. These are solutions that were proposed for um, health workers and attitudinal issues with health workers. Many of the comments were incredibly interesting. And I wanted to acknowledge that there was a lot of thoughtful um, thoughtfulness in these. I think it's clear that this is, this is not just um, a, a gender related issue, but it's one that people have been working on for a long time. So next slide, please. So within those interventions that people have proposed to be able to support health workers and, and address the poor quality services and, and possible negative health provider attitudes, it was very interesting to see who it is you thought you should bring on board to address this. And I wanted to make one underscore one thing here. Uh, this, this was a, a piece that I took directly from the homework, but I saw this frequently, um, not just in this homework, but actually throughout the course, which is, uh, for example, the last bullet, you really need to address both the care caregivers and the um, healthcare workers. And it said, although it seems that the gap may be in healthcare workers' behaviors, sometimes caregivers also make repeated mistakes like not carrying the beneficiary's card of previous vaccine info or not looking at messages or communications sent out for due dates. And it's important to tell the caregivers too to take care of a few small things so that the healthcare worker doesn't feel burdened. And yes, that's true. Um, I wanna make sure um, to, to be clear also, one of the things that we are recognizing now um, in, in a lot of research is really the issue of trauma and how trauma affects people's ability to move around in the world. So we know, particularly do, during COVID, that um, people are struggling and people, meaning caregivers, as well as healthcare workers. So it's really um, important for the healthcare system to be able to have measures in place so that healthcare workers can develop, the, uh, can deliver the best possible care to those who show up. And I think we need to be very mindful, especially that right now we know in normal circumstances, three out of 10 women um, encounter some level of gender-based violence in their lives and how that then affects how they move around with COVID, in some areas, that number has doubled. And we also know that in areas, um, in war-torn areas or areas of conflict, that can go up to seven out of 10 women experiencing some level of gender-based violence. So we need to be mindful of that and recognize that anytime, anytime a caregiver shows up for vaccine services, regardless of how confused or perhaps unorganized they might seem, it's really an opportunity to celebrate. And the fact that they made it there is really important. And it's, it's what we want to see. So making sure that all of us are cognizant that we're part of a health system and our duty is to make sure that everybody who shows up for vaccination really are supported and then that we also support the healthcare workers who deliver day in and day out um, for their populations and communities. Next slide, please. So lastly, we asked what types of information you'd need to make the case about this gender barrier. Again, we're talking about the um, quality services and possible negative health provider attitudes. So I found it really interesting that uh, the following, somebody said, well, we need to know what the public or the village opinion on the services that they're providing, which I thought was an excellent remark. And then how do healthcare workers actually view the public that they work for? 
that's that's a very interesting consideration and one that is very important to take note of. And then is the staffing adequate for the population size? We know that globally there's a huge staffing shortage for healthcare workers. And then lastly, somebody mentioned all five of these very well, gender distribution of healthcare workers, attitudes of the healthcare workers, healthcare workers workload, their skills and training, and then their, their motivation. And all those are, are spot on. So that's it for the homework re recap. I'm going to pass this over to Rebecca Fields, and she's going to be talking to us about assessing progress to reduce gender-related barriers to immunization. Rebecca, on to you. Thanks very much, and a warm welcome to everybody today. So glad that you are making it for this last session. And actually, Willow, could we just go back to the comment about um, the health workers getting frustrated about the caregivers not remembering? Um, that was a very interesting um, comment. Um, and I just want to pick up on that for a moment because I think, no, uh, let's see, I think it's the next one maybe. Although uh, sometimes caregivers also make repeated mistakes, like not carrying the beneficiary's card um, uh, with the previous vaccine information or not looking at messages or communication sent for due dates. So I think um, you know one of the challenges that we face, especially recognizing the gender element to some of this communication is to try to figure out, are there additional channels um, or additional resources that can be mobilized, community volunteers or others who can help relieve some of the burden from the health workers who are so overstretched in many cases, um, so that, again, the caregiver gets the message when they need the message. You know, we know that in many countries, maybe most countries, there is a long gap between, say, DTP3 uh, at uh, four and a half months and a first dose of measles vaccine at about nine months in most countries. And even if the health worker has told the mother uh, when the child has come for DTP3 at four and a half months um, that they need to come back at nine months, that's a lot of time between the two doses, between the four and a half months and the nine months. Um, and therefore, finding additional methods for outreach to reinforce the messages um, about when and where to return for vaccination using other channels than the health workers is so important. And I think um, that's part of what we were uh, getting at a little bit last week in um, the breakout group that was about different communication channels. So I just wanted to touch on that to sort of uh, 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 encourage us all to think about what other types of information channels could be used to provide the information when it's needed to um, the caregivers, um, you know, before they come back for vaccination. Otherwise, we may lose them from coming back at all. If they've lost the vaccination card, they may fear coming back at all. So let's move on to the next um, presentation then, which I'll get started with. Right. Um, so I'm talking now about um, assessing progress. And there are different ways, of course, to assess progress. Um, and there are a number of different indicators and metrics that have already been proposed with regards to uh, looking at gender barriers uh, to immunization and how to mitigate them. So I think you've all had the opportunity to look through the document, Why Gender Matters. And if you have gone through that, you will see that there is an Annex 3, which contains many pages actually of proposed indicators, uh, proposed metrics to identify gender related barriers to immunization. And these fall into four large categories. The first is to what extent are mothers empowered to decide on health related matters within uh, the family? Um, the next is uh, looking at excuse me, indicators related to, to what extent to women's multiple roles in the family um, and other access barriers influence their ability to obtain health care for themselves and their children. And, you know, to what extent does the health knowledge and literacy of women impact their understanding? Uh, the third category is to what extent does the quality of service 
So what we were just talking about a moment ago with the homework, um, to what extent is the quality of service um, discourage women from attending health facilities or accessing care? And finally, the fourth category is what role does the community play in providing a supportive environment for demand and utilization? And so that gets a little bit at what I was just talking about, where there could be other community channels that are used to provide some of that essential um, information about vaccination to back up what uh, the health worker is, has, has been saying and to help sort of alleviate some of the burden on them, even as they do need to provide that essential information and to maintain good interactions with, um, with caregivers. Um, as you go through Annex 3 in Why Gender Matters and you look at that, uh, uh, the indicators, one of the things that you will see is that most of these indicators um, require a source of information as being household surveys, such as demographic and health surveys, or else some kind of health facility as their source. Some of them do propose using different types of program data that can be um, uh, collected on a specific basis and that individual countries can choose to collect. But really, a lot of these have as their source the large household surveys, such as DHS. Now, demographic and health surveys don't happen every day. They don't happen every year. They usually only happen every um, uh, you know, five or six years. Same thing with um, uh, 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 multiple indicator cluster surveys. So that means that as we think about trying to gain information and assess how our interventions are going in the shorter term, we need to think about what other kinds of data can we use as sources. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, I also wanted to highlight uh, this other document, which you've seen before, this really excellent guide from the UNICEF uh, Regional Office in uh, South Asia, Immunization and Gender, a practical tool, uh, practical guide um, uh, to integrate gender lens, excuse me, integrate a gender lens into immunization programs. Um, and this too includes an annex uh, with some examples of indicators. And so again, this is just to draw this to your attention. I think one of the things that you can see with these sorts of indicators is again, they require sort of high level data collection. So for example, we've got some data on uh, immunization coverage, some indicators on immunization coverage. Um, we also have indicators, quantitative data on the number of female and male uh, vaccinators per 100,000 population, number of female vaccinators per union council or whatever a, a, a disaggregated administrative level happens to be in a given country. And then there are several proposed indicators on women's empowerment. Most of these are not specific to immunization. They're really useful indicators, but they're not specific to immunization. Some of them come from different types of indices. For example, the Gender Development Index, about five or six uh, bullet points down from UNDP, the Gender Empowerment Measure. Um, but again, they're not specific to exactly which sorts of interventions we may be introducing to try to address and reduce um, gender barriers to immunization. Next slide, please. So just during the next few minutes, I want to talk about uh, how what we measure depends on what our interventions are, and really so important, what we envision as the change we're hoping to see. Um, so, uh, last week, we discussed uh, five, six different uh, types of interventions, um, and we're going to refer back to them again in a moment. But so the first one was to improve access to routine immunization and COVID-19 vaccination by bringing services closer to places that women frequent. The second was engaging men um, for uh, supporting women and children to get vaccinated. The third was to improve the quality and experience of services, which we were just talking about from the home work. Um, the fourth was using multiple appropriate communication channels to reach women. The fifth was working with local NGOs, uh, especially to help ensure that service delivery design and micro planning and implementation and monitoring all have a strong gender lens. And the sixth was improving gender equity in leadership. So as we continue to discuss in this session today about uh, assessing progress, we want to try to make sure that we are pegging our um, measurement approaches to what it is that we are hoping to see change. Um, next slide, please. 
And as we do so, it can be useful to refer back to this model, which we've shown a couple of times now. We've introduced it in session one and three, I think, uh, or one and two, uh, about the journey to health and immunization. So this is really a journey, right? This has six different steps to it. And as we think about our interventions to reduce gender-related barriers, we can think about what are the opportunities we have both for the interventions themselves, but also to measure whatever change may be taking place with regard to that particular um, uh, part of the journey. So for example, if we are doing something to try to improve knowledge, awareness, and belief, uh, you know, uh, step number one at, at the top left here, that means that we can consider indicators um, that could be locally collected that speak to whether there is indeed increased knowledge, awareness, and belief. But we may want to also make sure to balance that out with indicators that take us further along this journey so that we're not so um, focused on one area or one type of barrier that we may lose sight of other related barriers that also um, take into account uh, what, the, what the caregiver is experiencing. So I just want to take us through an example here and let's go to the next slide, please. Right, so last week we had an excellent presentation by Wendy Abbey uh, about the experience in Accra, Ghana, with reducing barriers to vaccination among Kaiye. And if you'll recall, the Kaiye are female headquarters, the, the women who are carrying major loads on their heads um, in the markets in, in Accra, Ghana. And they are pretty well localized. They are in certain places. They are concentrated largely in certain parts of Accra. Um, and if you recall back from uh, what Wendy described last week, there were several different activities that were undertaken. Also in this activity, and I should just mention that I worked with Wendy on that activity, so have some understanding of what our project parameters were. This was an activity where we had very limited resources and a short time frame to work within. And so that meant that, that that had implications for what methods we could use um, for assessing progress. We didn't have the option of doing household uh, surveys, such as you know, a DHS survey or some other population-based survey. Um, and also, as it happened, this occurred, uh, this intervention uh, was being carried out right about the same time that the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And so that really did complicate some of our um, intentions for this activity. But with that said, um, I just wanted to point out some of the ways in which we approached the monitoring and evaluation approach. Um, so first we thought in terms of, well, what is the change that we are expecting to see? And you'll recall that Wendy spoke that um, the, the Kaya do not speak the same language as other people in Accra, most other people in Accra, because they come from a different part of the country. And also um, they have gatekeepers, they have male gatekeepers who kind of control what they do. And Wendy described that it was essential to work through those Kaya male gatekeepers to gain access to the Kaya themselves. So that meant needing to think about the Kaya gate gatekeepers as well as the Kaya. So the expected changes that we were looking for included the following, looking at the left-hand side of this table, that among the Kaya gatekeepers, we wanted to see greater knowledge of and support for second year of life 2YL vaccination. How would we know? How would we know that this was actually happening? What were the sorts of indicators that we had? Well, we kept records on the number of meetings with those Kaya gatekeepers, the numbers of those gatekeepers that participated in meetings with the project staff. So in other words, it's not enough just to say how many meetings were held, but did those Kaya gatekeepers actually participate in them? Uh, we also produced reference materials with talking points and the vaccination schedule. So we tracked how many um, of those reference materials were distributed to the Kaya's, how many of the Kaya's had those uh, gatekeepers had uh, those materials. Um, we also tracked the number of Kaya leaders who agreed to appoint Kaya as peer educators. 
So then moving on to the next type of change we expected to see, oops, sorry, um, we looked at among the CAIA themselves, was there increased knowledge about second year of life vaccination? Uh, you know, where, why it was important and where to go to get it. And for that, we recognized that peer education was going to be a very critical aspect because the peer educators are credible. So they speak the same language as the CAIA. So we looked at the number of CAIA who agreed to become peer educators, uh, the number of peer education sessions that were conducted with them, and the number of CAIA taking part in each peer education session. Um, then we looked at uh, another expected change was among the CAIA participation in their participation in the weekend immunization sessions, because what we really wanted to see was that the number of CAIA children would actually receive vaccination. So for that, we had a different data source. The others had project records as the data source, but to see how many of the children of CAIA received vaccination which is ultimately what we wanted, we needed to look over at the health facility records and particularly the tally sheets for the days when those weekend immunization services were offered in the communities that were heavily populated by the CAIAs. And finally, we looked at the continued use of interventions um, to see, well, for the different interventions that were in our project, what did the CAIA and their gatekeepers and the health personnel think about the desirability, the feasibility and the long-term viability of continuing with those different interventions. Um, next slide, please. So apparently Albert Einstein <laughs> is the person who said um, something that we, we always kind of take into account, which is not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts, you know, is really important. Last week, we had a little bit of a discussion about the use of quantitative data and the use of qualitative data, um, that they both are important, that they serve somewhat different purposes, they complement each other, um, and that they both uh, need to be uh, conducted. We, we need to collect data using both techniques in order to understand both what is happening and how much it's happening, but also to understand why it is or is not happening. And that's where the qualitative research methods or the qualitative data collection methods wind up being so important. Next slide, please. And so just to conclude here, um, uh, last week, Wendy mentioned that um, uh, that towards the end of the project, we uh, the the CAIA project, uh, um, there was collection of qualitative data that helped to augment, not take the place of, but augment our learning that came from the quantitative data. Uh, so that meant collect connecting excuse me, collecting interviews or focus group discussions with different types of people, with the beneficiaries, who in this case were the CAIAs, female caregivers, um, with the male partners or the male gatekeepers, with the health personnel themselves, with community leaders, um, and possibly with other types of stakeholders who had a role in all of this. So I just wanted to take a moment here to pause and say, okay, um, I would welcome in the chat box your thoughts about other quantitative and qualitative methods. I mean, again, the quantitative methods can include such things as, as I mentioned, different types of household surveys or facility surveys, um, different types of administrative records that can be kept, uh, project records. But also, um, you know, we have the, the need for the types of qualitative data um, that, again, complements the quantitative data. So I just wanted to take a moment here and see if people have comments in the chat box um, and other things that they would like to add on this, um, on what I've mentioned so far. Are there other quantitative methods that you yourself have found useful? And certainly Wendy, uh, if you're on the line, I would welcome any additional thoughts you have on this, um, but certainly um, from other participants as well. Any questions about what I've just been talking about? All right, then I'm going to move on to our um, exercise here. We've got three poll questions. Um, okay, 
So last week we talked about some specific gender related interventions. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do now is ask your views. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, provide information, just a summary of what the intervention was, and then propose some possible indicators, possible indicators. And we'd like your views on which ones you think are most applicable. Okay, so in the first instance here for poll question number one, we have uh, our, our gender specific intervention. Number one was to improve access to routine immunization and COVID-19 vaccination by bringing vaccination to the places and events that women frequent or go to. And so the possible, you know, some possible indicators, these are just proposed. And what we'd really like is your views on what you think are the top three that are most specific to actually measuring progress on the intervention, on this intervention about improving access by bringing services closer to women. Um, so the, the possible indicators from which you can choose are uh, A, the percent of women who report that they must have permission from their husband or another relative to take a child for vaccination. So again, we'd ask you to think about, okay, does that possible indicator relate to improving access by bringing services closer to women? Letter B, percent of women who report that it is hard to get vaccination services for themselves or their child because they cannot go to the vaccination clinic on their own. C, percent of mothers who do not get their child vaccinated because the facility was too far. D, percent of service delivery points offering immunization services. E, percent of children who are up to date with immunizations. Or F, percent of caregivers satisfied with the quality of service. And again, for each of these, please determine which ones you think fit best with this intervention of improving access by bringing vaccination closer to where women are. So let's go to the poll question then, the poll itself. Uh, MJ? So it says, hold on, we were, um, the technology is also oh, okay. um, an issue. So I got a note from Ayesha that said, if you go to the bottom of the screen and there should be polls, so, oh, this is why we had to switch who was who was providing the screenshots. So let me see. I have access. I'll go ahead and launch. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So just um, choose the top three that relate to this intervention, okay? about uh, improving access by bringing vaccination closer um, to the places and events that women frequent. So this is about improving access to services. Great, we have the responses coming in. So we'll just give everyone about a minute to respond. And please, if you can um, respond in the poll itself rather than in the um, uh, chat box, we can get everybody's um, views. Great, we're just about at 50%. So we'll just keep on waiting, and give everyone some time to respond. And we're hoping to get about how many responses? Um, we'll hope to, I mean, hope to give everyone on the call yeah. a chance. <laughs> but we, we usually close around 75% uh, of participants. So we're about at 66. So everyone just make sure that to click your response on the pop-up on your screen. Great. We'll close it in about 10 seconds. Hmm, so Gaspar cannot see the poll. I wonder why. That's, that's too bad. Sorry about that, Gaspar. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Can you see those, Rebecca? Yes, thank you Great. so much. So we can see that the two top options 
were uh, uh, B and C. Oh, Wendy, you can't see the poll either. Hmm. 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 I'm so sorry for that. Okay, so please do uh, just provide your responses in the chat box then. Very sorry for that. Uh, okay, so we see that the two top responses are B and C, the percent of women who report that it's hard to get vaccination because of the distance, and the percent of mothers uh, who felt the facility was too far. And then that's followed by percent of women, letter A, who uh, said they had to get permission from their husband or another relative. Um, okay. So uh, thanks very much for that. And we'll be saving these poll question responses, I believe, correct? Yes. Great, okay. So it'll give us some chance to reflect on that later in the discussion. Okay, let's move on to the second poll question then. Uh, okay, so we're going to do the same thing now, asking you to select the top three. And this intervention this time is about using multiple appropriate communication channels to reach women with key information to build trust and understanding about routine immunization. Um, okay, uh, so everybody can see this one, right? So just pick the top three. And again, the choices are percent of women who are up to date with, excuse me, percent of children who are up to date with immunization. Uh, B, the percent of women who know where to get their child vaccinated, the percent, C, the percent of women who report that vaccinations cost too much, uh, D, the percent of caregivers who trust the safety and efficacy of vaccines, E, the percent of women who have weekly exposure to mass media, and what is this, F, the percent of caregivers with knowledge about vaccines and the recommended schedule. Now, you may feel that all of these are applicable, but we are asking that you only select what you view as the top three. Great, we're starting to get some responses, um, about at 30% now. So we'll give everyone about, about 30 more seconds just to make sure everyone gets a chance to fully unpack this question and get their responses in the... Thanks, Gaspar. So we want a few more responses here, or as many as we can get, actually. <laughs> we want to have at least 75% response and even higher if possible. Great, everyone just, we're, we're gonna keep it open for about 10 more seconds, so make sure you get your responses in. And then we will share the results. Okay, great. So great. we've got about 78 people responding at this point. And from those who were able to do the poll, we have um, the, the top uh, selections being um, uh, B, those who know where to get their child vaccinated. Uh, the next one about those who trust the safety and efficacy. Um, and finally, a, a clear winner <laughs> with the percent of caregivers with knowledge about the vaccines and the recommended schedule. Um, and uh, then let's move on to poll question number three. All right, so again, choosing the top three. Um, this is about male engagement. Uh, the intervention is um, uh, conduct information sessions with men about the importance of routine immunization and COVID-19 vaccination for women and children. Um, this is a shortened way of describing the intervention. We had longer uh, wording for it last week. So our options here, if you choose the top three, those uh, percent of women who report they must have permission from their husband or another relative to take the child for vaccination, the percent of fathers who report they have accompanied the mother in taking the child for vaccination, the percent of vaccinators who are male, the percent of fathers with knowledge of vaccines and the recommended schedule, the percent of women who report they have sufficient financial resources to take their child for vaccination, and the percent of caregivers with knowledge about vaccines and the recommended schedule. So again, you may feel that you know all of these are applicable, but we are asking you to really prioritize which one you think, which ones you think would make the biggest difference. Great, we're just about at fifty percent, so we'll keep it open for about 
10, 15 more seconds. Great. All right, I will share the results. Great, we have a few more coming in. Okay, great. And um, thanks to those who uh, contributed via the chat box. I'm sorry that we can't, uh, you know, bring that all together in one place, but thank you for doing so. So we see um, that um, uh, accompanying the mother for taking the child for vaccination is the top one, um, followed by fathers with knowledge of vaccines and the vaccination schedule. Um, and uh, then, um, um, uh, the first one, uh, women who report they must have permission from their husband. Um, okay, so this is really interesting. Male engagement is a very dynamic area right now, so there's lots to think about with this one. Uh, let's stop sharing then. Thank you. Um, and let's go back to uh, the, the, uh, our presentation then. And the purpose for doing this is to illustrate that we have the opportunity to really think about what would be the most meaningful ways of thinking through what would change as a result of our, in, um, our innovation, excuse me, intervention, because that then serves as the basis for deciding what we're going to measure and what sources of data we could use for doing so. We are behind time. We're going to move along now, but thank you very much for participating in the poll and we'll be sharing the results and hopefully we can bring in the responses from those who um, contributed in the chat box. Thank you. Over to you, Gaspar Kome. And um, uh, Willow, are you going to introduce Gaspar? Yes, very quickly. Thanks very much, Rebecca. I know we're over time a little bit, but I think it's well worth it because that's, that's actually one of the key points of what we're trying to um, to get at here is really figuring out how to know what whether or not the activities are are making progress. So we're going to um, welcome Gaspar Comé, who's a project coordinator with Village Reach, and um, he's going to be discussing a community community based participatory research um, activity that also had a, a human centered design component. And uh, they, they to work on amplifying caregiver and health worker voices to help solve under two under immunization in Mozambique. And um, Gaspar, we're very happy to have you and, and welcome. Um, we are going to be showing a pre recorded presentation from Gaspar. And he's here, he's actually one of the participants, and he'll He'll be live at the end of the of the video to answer any questions and have a bit of a discussion around the work that was done. So MJ, with that, I'll let you proceed. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Is uh, I'll be talking about the work we are doing in Mozambique, which is basically a start uh, conducted in two districts. Jile and Namaroi in Zambezi province, Mozambique, which is funded by the World Cup Trust through the public engagement funds. Uh, the overview of this one was to identify caregivers at the health workers' voice uh, and uncover new insight solutions by using the community based perspective research and human centered design. And this is being implemented in two countries, Mozambique and Malawi. So the study was uh, divided in three phases, being the first one of identification, and the second one of implementation, and the last one will be uh, of devaluation. Over the first phase of identification, caregivers were hired and trained in qualitative data collection and analysis. And the second phase, uh, which is of implementation, uh, we used a human-centered design approach to co-create and implement solutions to address the problems identified on the first phase. The last, which is the third phase uh, for the evaluation, we will be monitoring and measuring impact of the solutions we are implementing. For this, we have a strong partnership with the University of Cape, Western Cape Town, which will be coming and we expect they will be conducting holistic evaluation uh, to understand outcomes, but contextual factors also driving the results we will generate. So over the first phase, uh, we had some findings 
uh, to which we identified attempting to understand why children under two are not completing uh, their immunization time. So some of these findings were that uh, there was a reduced trust in health system. Uh, there was also power imbalance in social dynamics, lack of social support, concern about side effects. But overall, we also understood that compound of these barriers contributed highly uh, over immunization dropouts. Still on the second, uh, on the first phase, we had some specific gender considerations of the stat. The first one was that we primarily hired uh, caregiver researchers who were uh, women so that they could uh, conduct data collation and analysis. But also we opted by interviewing uh, in our sampling, women who were directly affected by this problem in number 32, being 16 in each of these two. In terms of uh, specific findings uh, around gender, we found out that uh, at the communities where we conducted the study, immunization is understood as being of a mother's responsibilities, but also women face uh, safety concerns to travel to the health facilities seeking for vaccination service. Also, we understood that the women lack control of financial resources and transportation, which they could use to go and come from the health facilities. They also have physical difficulties traveling to health facilities due to postpartum complications, pregnancy, and also illness. Women also related that uh, they wish men could help them more in seeking vaccination for their, for their children. So on the second phase, which uh, is of the implementation, we conducted two HCD or two human centered design in each of the districts. And with this group generated or this workshop generated two main uh, solutions. So the first one is uh, using educational messages about routine immunization. So we are now designing pictorial cards and key messages for caregivers and their husbands around the importance of vaccine, side effects, how to comfort or minimize the side effects after vaccination. Also, we have the community and health facility collaboration. So we are, what we are basically doing is creating strong linkages between health facilities and communities to support immunization planning and also uh, execution by both healthcare workers and community health workers. And last solution we are bringing is on planning mobile brigades, planning and executing mobile brigade. So what we are creating is a structure of implementing or planning and executing mobile brigade in a joint way between the, the health facility workers, the community health workers. So for the solution, we are also focusing on some gender aspects. One is that our educational parts are aimed at encouraging also husbands to raise more awareness on participating of the children immunization. And we will be using also image of husbands or men who are positively helping and supporting the, the immunization of their children. This is an example of a pictorial card we are designing. It's still a prototype. We are expecting that uh, over the, the, the end of this, this card will be, will be more colorful and will be reflecting images of men supporting and how can men also support uh, immunization of the child or their family. Uh, and also with these, the educational cards will directly address female caregivers' concern identified in the research phase. But we are also using uh, our solution implementation to focus on mobile brigades to reduce challenges of distance and safety, using issues for women in accessing vaccines at the health facilities. And so now the big question, how to access if we are making progress in addressing gender in immunization. So we have three strategies here. One is during solution design in prototyping workshop, we also centered female caregivers participant and got feedback if the intervention addressed their concerns or no. So basically what we did was bringing uh, caregivers from the two districts of start and we involved them in the co-creation phase to ensure that the solutions we are designing also address 
their specific gender barriers. And also we will be conducting the evaluation, evaluation for the solution. For that, uh, external evaluation by the University of Western Cape will be assessing the impact on coverage from an equity lens and acceptability in the interpretation. And lastly, Again, I uh, will be an evaluation of our community-based participant of research and human-centered design approach and the external evaluation by UWC, which is our University of Africa, Cape Town, will be coming here to understand how our approach to solution design, which centered female caregivers, has influenced overall project uh, outcomes. So uh, to finalize, uh, here are some links to where you, we can keep learning more. Uh, about our project, about our work here in Mozambique. So we have uh, the links to our start overview, the Mozambique site findings, and the caregiver research methods. And for more information, of course, we, there are also sites you can you can reach out. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Great. Thanks very much, Gaspar. And if you want to unmute, and uh, we have a couple of minutes. If participants have any kind of questions related to Gaspar's presentation. Um, and Gaspar, if there's anything else that you would like to add live um, as, as we consider uh, the good work that was presented here through uh, Village Reach in Mozambique. Okay, hello. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, well, first, I, I don't see any question at all at the chat. So I can take the chance maybe just to, to add uh, on some few aspects of, of this, this project. One thing that uh, maybe can be very interesting about this, uh, this work we are developing here is that at all the time we we used caregivers where fame, female uh, in also in the start phase, what means that we, we identified caregivers from the two districts to train them as uh, caregiver researchers. And we prioritized uh, caregivers who had uh, children under two so that they could be trained to become uh, researchers and they were locally identified in the two districts. Uh, we, we did this because we, one, we wanted to ensure that uh, the, our researchers, they met in terms of language, uh, the language our population of state uh, spoke, but also we, we wanted to ensure that uh, our researchers also shared some sort of experience through the problem we, we, we wanted to, to understand in the start. And a, a good feedback we got from this is that now that we went on the second phase, which is of implementation, uh, we went back to the, those communities and we, we selected some participants for the human-centered design we conducted, I, I just mentioned there. And we got some positive feedbacks, for example, by the, the community leaders who were very happy to see that we are still engaged with the uh, healthcare researchers. And actually, we still we are still working with them after the implementation of the phase. Now we, we currently have one uh, still employed with us because the other two they got uh, different offers. So this this uh, was good point on bringing caregivers at this at this level. Yeah. And yeah. So I think Erasmus has has his hand. Oh, Erasmus, did you have a question or a comment? And make sure you're off mute um, so we can hear you. Erasmus, go ahead. Yeah, hello. Hi. Are you hearing me? Yes, we hear you just yeah. fine. You're good. Uh, I thank the presenter very well from Mozambique. The presentation is well noted. It's so beautiful. But one thing is certain. That's a, I want to find out from him, the immunization dropout or the low immunization coverage areas in Mozambique, do the uh, method he outlined, do all those methods work for all the communities? I'm asking this question. 
because community A, probably it might be the same problem, but the method that will work in community A might be different from the method that will work in community B, slightly different. Despite all might be of all gender in immunization, but it depends on the area. So I'm too willing and anxious to know whether the same method that they used to achieve work for all. Over and thank you. Thanks, Erasmus. So, Gaspar, did you did you hear that? You know, it really kind of center, centering on the idea of localization and whether or not this effort you think would also um, be successful in another community. Yeah, I got that. And thank you, uh, Erasmus, for your question. Uh, but I, I would I would give my answer to in two ways. One is there was a study that was conducted which we used photo voice and this method was applied into two districts. Uh, and actually I think uh, using uh, the same method can be applied for several contexts, but maybe there can be a concern of after identifying uh, specific barriers, then specific barriers can be addressed in several ways based on community to community. Now for these two communities we studied, we brought them together and actually the solutions we identified fed <laughs> similarly for the two communities. Maybe this can be attributed to the fact that we are intervening in two communities that are simil similar in terms of geography. They are also similar in terms of challenges they do have. And these two communities, uh, I mean, districts we selected based on the high rates uh, of under immunization we got from the health authorities in the province. Right, right. So that's it, right? You have to, you actually have to identify what the issue is um, before implementing a solution. So we had another question. Um, from Anith Asri and, and it says, curious to hear if you have any other recommendations for other countries or programs that are keen to leverage caregivers during the ideation or solution creation phase. So what would you recommend to other countries who think this is an interesting process? Well, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I got you. Thank you so much. I think one one is uh, the issue of mobilization because you know it's not it's not easy, uh, mainly considering or assuming uh, the origin of these caregivers. They are rural uh, caregivers or they are urban caregivers. So for our intervention, for example, we are focusing more on the rural area. So one challenge we had was uh, first mobilization. And uh, again, there's gender gender problem here because we were taking women from their communities and we brought them to, to a different district for this uh, workshop. So basically what we did was uh, sitting with the, with the community leadership, also with their schools back in their community so that we could mobilize them uh, so to get a, a sort of permission for their wives to, to leave home for a day or two days to participate in this. So this would be my recommendation, strong coordination between the team trying to implement this and uh, the community back uh, they want to implement. Right, so that's, yeah, that's a good, that's actually a very good perspective. Um, so I think there was one other one. So this is a comment. So Kisi said, I think the general principles can be applied, but there would be the need to recognize the specific context of each community and adapt accordingly. Exactly. And I had I had actually a question relative to relative to the presentation. So you have some involvement with a university to do some more formal evaluation, some more formal external evaluation. And I think this gets back to what Rebecca's presentation was about, which is 
you know, there are always some trade-offs between being able to assess how things are going in terms of formality or informality and then timing. So if you want to go kind of for the gold standard and wait for big formal evaluations, that's what you're doing. You're waiting. You're waiting for some of those results. But they also provide an opportunity to, to recognize um, whether or not things are in place well enough to then possibly scale up. And do you see something like this effort, like this, uh, let's talk about vaccine study. Do you see this as a potentially model that could be scaled up? Or would it really have to be so localized that, that scaling up um, might become more difficult? Um, sorry, can you come again with your question? I'm sorry, I have missed you. Sure, sure. So because you guys are getting some really some formal external evaluation by, uh, I think it's the University of, of Western Cape, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know what the time frame is for that, but it would seem if, if you have a more formal external evaluation coming in, then those are some pretty significant building blocks. Do you think that having those results would allow some leverage for you to take this model and then and then scale it up. Yes, sure. Uh, the, 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 the partnership we had, one of the objective is uh, exactly that one of uh, having someone outside of the implementers to come and evaluate the process we we used from the start phase up to the generating solution and implementation of the, this intervention. But uh, one of the outcome of this is that if all goes well, this strategy can be scaled into other existing uh, problems, but also advocate um, at the government, uh, the province or at the national level so that this can be used as a method to generate solutions for specific problems the country has uh, around health, not just in immunization. So we think, yes, uh, using an external evaluation can, can bring or can add value to the results in the future, depending on how successful we go uh, in implementing these uh, solutions. Right, okay. Um, and so there's, an, there's another interesting question um, from uh, Mume, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And they asked, did you encounter any patriarchal society in the course of your research? And if yes, how did you penetrate that community with gender issues? Well, we thank you uh, for the, those, that question. We did not encounter specific community with, but which is patriarchal, but of course we we had some. I would not say the full community, but I would say part of part of community members who were uh, very conservative concerning uh, gender issues. And again, one one of the solution we had was that over the identification of respondents in the communities of specific caregivers to answer to our data collection tool, was that we used. The, Lead, government leadership at the district who then mobilized the, the community leadership and we set all together uh, and mobilizing them and explaining them what would be the result, possible result of doing this study and how can community benefit uh, from the start uh, now and in the future. And then the lead, community leaders went back and they mobilized the, the community members and in informing them there will be a team coming to conduct uh, this start. And one of the strategies we also used to, to minimize gender barrier was that we had, we used caregivers who were female. This was also a way to, to reduce uh, possible gender gender problem because, you know, in, in rural communities in Mozambique, when you go and interview uh, women, you better have uh, a woman doing that role also so that uh, there is no problem here. So that's why we primarily hired uh, caregivers who are also mother 
of under two facing the same problems uh, our respondents were, and we also use them over the start. Right, that's yeah, that's interesting. So I wanted to I wanted to to read what Wendy um, Abby, who had presented last week for us, what she says in the chat. She says it's important to mobilize and bring caregivers or service users into the ideation process. And a good strategy to use is to work closely with stakeholders, uh, the caregivers trust. Right, that's that's key. So. Let these trustworthy stakeholders also participate in the ideation process because the caregivers will feel more supported to engage with you and be involved in the implementation of the innovation after the ideation workshops. So I think that's actually a, a that's a learning point for almost everything that we encounter in various um, immunization activities and interventions, uh, it's really the speed of trust. If you are working in a community and you are working with people they trust, um, and there is a level of confidence, um, things go far better and much better and you get far better results. So um, is there any, are you, do you have any last words, Gaspar, that you'd like to share? And if you would like to, I noticed that you've kept your video off, um, not to put you on the spot, but if you'd like to turn on your video so we can see you, or if, if you have any other closing remarks about the work, about this excellent work. And I would mention, um, you know, the last, your last slide presented some documentation on this study, and we also put it in the chat. And I would highly recommend that participants, when you have the, have a moment, to check out some of those resources. They're very, very good. So, Gaspar, do you have any any last um, any last words you'd like to share? Oh, well, just just say thank you for 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 all the the Boost community for this opportunity of sharing the experience of the work we are doing here, and uh, we are pretty. We are learning a lot uh, doing this integration in the two districts we are we we are implementing, and uh, again this was a really good opportunity to learn how to learn more about gender gender barriers of interventions we are doing. Uh, uh, we are all doing in different communities. So yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, thanks very much for being here and for your presentation. So, um, Erasmus, is that a new hand or the or the hand you had up previously? I'm going to assume it's the it's a previous hand. So, if we can go on to the next slide, please. I wanted to mention. So, as I as I had said at the beginning of the session, unfortunately, Dr. Ahmad wasn't able to be with us live, and we've had a really constructive conversation, and and I th I think we. We spent some important time both um, with Rebecca's presentation and also with Gaspar's presentation. So what I would like to propose, um, what we were going to do next was to show a presentation from Dr. Ahmad that was pre-recorded on the analysis of gender and social determinants of health in urban poor communities. Um, and it's uh, from Pakistan. It's actually an excellent presentation it's just under 13 minutes long. So rather than trying to rush through this presentation and then end up being really squeezed for time at the end, what I'd like to propose is that we will put, um, we will put this video presentation on the platform so that you will have an opportunity to check it out on your own when you have the time. And I would highly recommend it. The results that they had from their uh, from the work that they did in urban communities in Pakistan, uh, there were 10 mega urban communities that they worked in and their results were really incredible. So we are not going to present that video right now. And yes, we would ask if you take a moment on your own time to be able to watch it. I think that you would find it most 
valuable and, and very interesting and helpful to you. So with that, next slide, please. This is sort of a perfect segue into our very last bit of information with you, which is the importance of documenting and sharing your learning. So we just had a really remarkable presentation by Gaspar. You'll have an opportunity to look at Dr. Ahmad's presentation on your own. And we've offered you during, over the last month during these um, sessions, many, many resources that have been precisely curated to be able to support the topic of this course. Um, and I know I have said this multiple times, but it's so important. This is a new field. So gender and immunization is a very nascent field. We are still learning about how gender barriers interact with immunization. So we need to make sure that we have a solid knowledge base for that. So as all of us are working towards trying to assess and see if our activities and, and um, the work that we're doing, identifying and addressing gender-related barriers in immunization, we are trying to see what's working and what's not working. And we can't do that in a vacuum. So you have a number of resources in hand right now, but you also have the opportunity and really a responsibility because you're part of this now is to really document what you're doing, how you're doing it, how well it's going, or even if it's not going well. I think there's a tendency to always want to talk about all the successes. And of course, those are important, but there are significant learning opportunities to some level of failure. And, um, you know, so one of the things that they say in the digital health realm is fail often and fail fast. Because the idea is if you're paying attention, you, you realize something isn't working, you can pivot. So don't be afraid of the failures. Just be mindful of being able to make the change that's needed. So this is, you know, my plea to you to please make sure you're documenting at some level, whether it's formal or informal, how things are going, and then share it. Next slide, please. I wanted to hearken back to homework from um, between our sessions two and three, when we had asked how you might be addressing some of the gender barriers that had been listed and then whether or not you're documenting them. And this is just a reminder that almost 70% of you said, yeah, we're not documenting that, right? And um, so that's a lost opportunity. Again, it doesn't have to necessarily be formal documentation, but we're now a community of people who have been together for over a month. We have provided resources to other groups who are doing similar work. And again, because this is a nascent area, it's really important that we're all learning together. So please make sure that you document as you're able. Um, it can be as simple as uh, writing a blog, or it can be as formal as as presenting um, peer-reviewed papers and getting some real formal evaluation. Just get the information out there. That's, that's the important part. Next slide, please. So a reminder that you know all of us, or most of us, have some level of work planning. And within those work plans, we always have objectives. Very frequently, objectives don't necessarily reflect gender barriers or even gender considerations, right? So we know that, that project objectives may not have anything specific to gender, but because gender is overarching and we now, I hope through this course, can identify where some of those barriers are, where they exist, and then what there are some possibilities 
for doing, um, for addressing those barriers, I would invite you to go back to your respective work plans or your respective uh, work processes and identify where there are entry points for reconsidering how you're doing your work and where the work would align with gender considerations. And then next, making sure you know your audience. Carol Hooks had joined us for session two and she gave a wonderful presentation about the importance of recognizing who your audience is, what motivates them, and then identifying the information that will map to whatever those audience motivations are. So if you get it right, you then invite your audience to become adv advocates in the gender and, gender and immunization efforts. And then in terms of formats, there are so many different formats now. I think uh, one of the things that I found um, excellent about Gaspar's presentation is when he talked about those educational cards that are being produced. And, um, and if you remember, you know, he showed a prototype that was still in black and white um, sketch. So there are many, many ways and many different formats to use to be able to present information and document the work that you're doing. And then lastly, the issue of timing. Um, we know right now that lots of global networks and lots of global organizations are paying very close attention. And in fact, some are funding efforts around gender and immunization. At the same time, there are things in place on a calendar that will help, um, that, that can help in whatever efforts you're doing to get some attention. I think um, one of the things I've noticed is that uh, there is a real um, emphasis. Every last week of April is World Immunization Week. And there's so much going on globally for that. That would be a wonderful time to maybe come out with some sort of documentation about work that you're doing, whether or not it was originally planned to be gender specific or not. Um, next slide, please. So here are just a few dates that are on global calendars that I wanted to remind you of. And as you're doing your work, thinking ahead about how you might build on existing calendar opportunities and really make a celebration of the gender and immunization efforts that are happening. You'll note that the last one is the beginning, beginning of the school year. That's always a busy time, but also a very good time to, to remind people about the importance of making sure their children, regardless of, of their children's age, making sure that they're safely vaccinated. <coughs> Next step, please. Next one. So here are some of the key takeaways from the last month of our work together. So first and foremost, we know that gender-related issues in immunization really go beyond focusing on co coverage discrepancies, right? So originally a lot of analysis of gender inequity and childhood immunization have generally focused uh, or concentrated on sex differentials in coverage between boys and girls and, and on um, uh, how broader aspects of gender inequality, like you know, a mother's education, how that can affect child immunization for both sexes. But uh, when people talked about gender and immunization in the past, they generally referred to sex differentials in coverage. I hope through the time that we've spent together that, that now you recognize that gender and immunization goes far beyond that. And we know that, as I previously mentioned, lots of global groups are paying significant attention and there's a growing focus on gender and immunization programs and that there are so many tools and resources available. And we have tried to provide what we think are really the best of the best 
Um, so keep those close at hand and refer to them as you're able. Uh, the idea that gender is a learned social construct, it's based on power, and because it's learned, it can also be unlearned and relearned differently for the benefit of everybody. Uh, there are many ways to frame gender-related barriers, and in general, those framings always reflect legal rights and status, cultural norms, perceptions, and beliefs, roles, responsibilities, and time use. Remember that time use is a really important one. Access to and control over assets and resources, another very critical aspect that many of you have addressed over the last month. And then patterns of power and decision-making, another really key piece that decision-making that we've recognized has really made a difference in terms of, of access um, to vaccination and immunization. Then as you're reviewing findings from various data and information sources, the importance of being able to use your criti critical thinking and always ask why, why does something appear that way? You know, what is that really about? Don't just stop at, at the first level, dig deeper and really try to get to the root causes and then be mindful of the journey to health and immunization, that infinity sign. You, that UNICEF infinity sign and tool, which is really an excellent resource. I think I mentioned in a previous, um, in a previous session, if you can print it out, put it on your wall. It's an important thing to, to make note of. Uh, and then make sure to document, document, document. So that's all I have. Next slide, please. This is something that uh, Inesan wrote in, in our first session together in the chat box, uh, that we are among the change makers. And indeed we are. And I'm so happy to be able to have had this time with you. I want to sincerely thank all of the participants, all of you who have done this work and stayed with, with us throughout the course. I hope we will continue to be in touch. Um, I want to sincerely thank all the presenters and all of the folks who we didn't hear, but who were really doing all of the laborious work on the other side to make this possible. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to MJ. Do you want to let us know of the, the links that people need to be aware of and any upcoming engagements from Boost. Absolutely. And just to echo Willow's sentiments, thank you to everyone who's participated the last four weeks. We know it's no small feat, but this is such an important topic. So just also want to thank our presenters and all the guest speakers we've had over the last four weeks. Um, so just a few reminders to take our post-session survey. We do look at those results very closely to inform future works and improve our sessions. Um, additionally, make sure you join the Boost Learning Group. Um, the learning group for this course will stay active. So even beyond this course, please feel free to um, add questions to the forum, post your updates in the live feed, um, and we, we will get notifications and you can continue to engage with this cohort of participants. Um, and then additionally, please join the course Telegram channel um, where you can also stay engaged with course participants. Um, just to echo and repeat what Liz mentioned at the beginning of the session, we will be leaving all homeworks and makeup assignments open for the next week. Um, all, um, it, all live sessions are required and homeworks are required to receive a certificate, which we will distribute via your Boost account. Um, so if you have any questions about um, things you're missing, please check the progress tracker, which we will share in the Telegram channel. And you're always welcome to email info at Boost Community. Additionally, um, if you're interested in kind of next steps and continuing to build your capacity, we have a few upcoming and ongoing boost engagements. Um, we encourage you to join our behavioral science immunization network, which is a learning group and occasionally have live engagements for. Um, additionally, we also have a new podcast episode out for our COVID-19 listening and learning series. Um, if you're interested in participating in another course, we also have our Storytelling for Change course. This is self-paced on a mobile device um, to use storytelling um, as a way to incorporate into your immunization programming. And then we also have our insights dialogue series, which looks 
closely at the influence of social media on behavior change with relation to health behavior and immunization. And we have an upcoming live engagement the first week of August, um, which everyone is welcome to. So with that, I will conclude the session and just want to thank everyone again for their time throughout the course and for joining us. Um, but we hope to see you on the Boost platform and on the Gender and Immunization Learning Group. So thanks, everyone.